Hey everyone, it's uh, David from Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. This is going to be a quick follow up to the CEM 120 First Light forensics video. And I'm going to demonstrate how I address the, the deck backlash in my mount. And I'll share what I did to minimize differential flexure, which was showing up as a floating polar alignment error in my PhD2 guiding sessions. Now, for those who have not seen the First Light Forensics video, there's a link in the description. And if you are an amateur astronomer or you have any interest in astrophotography or observatories, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. I usually publish once or twice a week, and I think you'll find the videos interesting and informative. Okay, with that, let's, let's dive into this. The PhD2 logs from my First Light sequence showed a significant amount of backlash on the deck axes. In fact, it read around 2,700 milliseconds, and that's just way too high for a mount of this design. The design is CEM 120, and generally it's an indicative of some kind of mechanical slack somewhere in the gearing system. Now, the good news is that the Ioptron CEM 120 was designed with some fairly convenient access points for the drivetrain components that needed to be adjusted. At least this is the case for the deck axes. And, and so the first thing that I thought, and I thought I would check, would be the, the gear mashing. Okay, so the, the deck gear mesh is spring-loaded, and this is the, uh, uh, the lever to release the gear. Um, right now it's in the lock position, but when you rotate the deck about, um, we'll call it 45 degrees, it reveals access to a hole where we can get a hex wrench in to loosen a lock set screw that allows you to then tighten the mesh assembly or loosen the mesh assembly. In my case, I'm going to try to tighten the mesh assembly about a quarter of a turn, maybe an eighth of a turn, to deal with the backlash. To do that, I first have to loosen the, 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 the locking screw. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Okay, so I've loosened it about a quarter of a turn, just enough where it's free. I'm now going to turn about, about that much. I don't, so about, about an eighth of a turn. And now I'm going to tighten the locking screw, retighten it. So at this point, we've tightened the mesh. And we're going to test to see whether or not that eliminates backlash. So after adjusting the gear mesh, I didn't see a noticeable improvement in the backlash measurement. So I then checked and I adjusted the belt tension. This belt is, it, it, it translates this rotational motion of the deck stepper motor into the rotation of the worm drive itself. And so any excess slack in the belt it will translate into measured backlash in, in PHD2. Okay, as shown in the prior illustration, you have to remove the deck casing cover to access the motor and the belt. And you can do this by removing the four, there are four bolts in that uh, cover, um, and you use your three millimeter hex wrench to do it. Once that cover's off, you can quickly test the tension of the belt. And for me, I think the belt needs to have no more than one or two millimeters of, of play. Um, if you go too tight, you'll hear it when you're slewing about the deck axes. And if you go too loose, you're still going to have backlash. So you're going to need to you know, play with this and get it right. So to tighten the belt tension, you have to loosen the motor bolts. About a quarter of a turn is all you need. And then you can apply pressure to that motor to take up the belt slack. You got to hold the pressure, that pressure on the motor while you tighten back those motor bolts. So you may, you may want some help with this. And uh, j just a side note, these are uh, M3.5 uh, pitch bolts, and they're about 10 millimeters in length. I actually think that they should be longer, at least 12 millimeters, perhaps as much as 16 millimeters. And I actually replaced a couple of mine when I felt like they weren't grabbing well. So um, 
Uh, again, test before you restore the cover. You're likely going to need to adjust several times to get this perfect. So this brought down the measured backlash to about 900 milliseconds. Still a little bit high for my taste, but certainly a nice improvement from the 2700 milliseconds that we measured during the first light sequence. So I decided to stick with it for now because I'm getting I'm actually getting excellent results on on the deck axes during you know tracking and guiding and we'll see that in a minute. Now if you recall I also had some issues with a drifting polar alignment error meaning that every session that I ran I had a different reading for the polar alignment error and I'm talking about variances of you know uh, 6 minutes and given that this mount is installed on an in an observatory with a permanent pier that polar alignment should be very accurate and any variance in the alignment error session to session should be reasonably minimized. Unless, of course, there's a variability somewhere in the guidance system itself. And in my case, I suspected that there was some differential flexure between the main OTA optical tube assembly and my guide scope. Okay, so one of the first places that we're going to double check is the actual saddle and we're going to ensure that we have a tight uh, secure grip on this dovetail plate this one lost one DD plate and uh, maybe we'll get just ever so slightly get a little a little bit more ratcheted down on that and and that's about as tight as she's going to get here so our next spot is the attachment of the guide scope to the second lost monday plate which is on the top of the c8 And that's about as tight as she's going to get. Tightening of the actual finder scope rings. Try and do this as evenly as possible. Taking my time and uh, that looks good. Yeah, there's no. Honestly, I don't think there's very much room here for tightening any further. Okay, so I also double checked to make sure that the main imaging uh, train um, was secure and there were no issues that could be causing additional flexure. So I eliminated any cable snags, any possibility of cable snags, removing anything that was unnecessary, including that dew heater strap around the guide scope. And then I made sure to check the physical connections of everything from the um, focal reducer, the extension tube, uh, the filter wheel, and I temporarily have an off-axis guider set up there. Um, that's not being used, but I just wanted to make sure that it's not contributing to any of the issues. Okay, with that done, we move to polar alignment. When I've been using sharp cap, I've been using the main scope as my polar alignment reference. And uh, tonight when I redo the polar alignment, I'm actually going to use the guide scope. Um, and the reason is that I, I believe that there's such significant flop in the mirror that um, when I do the polar line, polar line exercise using the SCT, the main optics, um, it's not reliable. I think that I'll have a more reliable polar alignment from the guide scope, and, um, and then we'll see how that affects things as well. 
So the net result of these steps was actually very positive, as we can see. The measured deck backlash was down to 900 milliseconds. And if, when we look at that backlash graph, you know, there's only one step that was needed to eat up the backlash versus three steps in the original first light session. And the guiding assistant actually still recommended that I enable deck backlash compensation, but I decided not to at this time. And, and if you look at the PhD2 logs, we see that the, the, the very, very stable tracking, the CEM120 is doing, you know, it, it, as it should, there's, you know, it's a strong polar alignment. There is no movement in the deck necessary. Um, and so therefore there were no deck corrections being issued at all. And I think that's awesome. So right now, deck is behaving. So there's no, it did not seem important to me to make any kind of tuning to the PhD2 settings at the moment. Also, when we look at the polar alignment error, we see that that value is far closer to what we measured using sharp, sharp cap. You know, so we're talking about a fraction of a minute. And it held across multiple sessions. Granted, they were short sessions. I was just doing some quick tests on the new calibration after these adjustments to the mount. And I'll continue to monitor this. So now what's left? Well, I plan to research the RA performance a bit. I'm actually fairly satisfied with what I'm seeing right now in the logs. The RMS values for these limited sessions I've run are consistent consistent with the RA, the, the PEC curve that was provided by iOptron, which was measured by encoders. So I'm um, within the published um, graph that iOptron sent, sent me. And so I, I don't have any concerns right now that, that the mount isn't performing well in the RA axes, but I still want to study this a little bit further because I've spent a lot of time on the deck. Now let me take a look at RA. So I'm probably going to run a, a long session probably on NGC 1975, which was the first light sequence that I ran with this mount. And so I'll run it for four or five hours and I'll revisit those PhD2 logs with an eye on the RA axes this time. And I'll be looking specifically at the periodic error to see and any other, you know, bad guiding patterns that we might see in RA that could potentially be addressable through mount or system opt optimizations. Okay, let's call that a wrap. I hope you all enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it, and each and every time it's a learning experience for me. I plan to continue to add videos to the CEM120 playlist, including the one on RA guiding optimizations, but also be on the lookout for some new playlists um, that I have planned for the channel. I have over four, uh, I have four uh, rigs that I use within the Astro DNA Observatory, and I have content for each and every one of them. So that's going to be coming out soon. Uh, and if you haven't done so already, go ahead, subscribe to the channel, and you'll get notifications as soon as the, uh, the material is published. And thanks so much for watching, and I will see you on the next video.